so it's my pleasure to uh, uh, to welcome uh, Professor Hasho Kapsura to the uh, to give the talk. Uh, so Professor Kapsura has uh, did his PhD in 2008 from mm -hmm. University of Tokyo, and then after a couple of postdocs, one at Lycan and then one at KIT in the US, he joined uh, Kapsura in University. And uh, in 2014, we moved back to his alma mater, uh, and where he's a professor now. And so he's going to tell us about uh, the quality. Yeah, yeah. Can you hear me now? Okay. I can hear you. Well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think I think it's on. Yeah, it's on. So, yeah, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizer for giving me the opportunity to present my talk and uh, this lecture. And actually, I'm one of the organizers. But uh, I'm more or less a nominal organizer, so most of the practical things have been done by local people like uh, Indra and Manoranjan. So uh, I'm not about that. But anyway, so today I'm going to talk about agnostic analogs of the body to insert it in two and three. <coughs> and yeah, this work was done in cooperation with with my ex-student, Yoki Kondo, and the uh, assistant professor of my group, Itaka Akagi. And my talk will be based on uh, the published papers in PRD, these papers. And the last one is the uh, review article published in PTEP. PTEP is a kind of a, a domestic journal in Japan. But uh, yeah, of course, it's welcome if you yeah, want to submit it to our journal. But anyway, so this is just a uh, video. And okay, so here's the plan of my talk. So in the first part, I'm gonna give some introduction and motivation. And first, uh, in the previous talk, uh, Jason talked a lot about what the topological inferences are. But uh, let me just quickly run through what the topological inferences are here. And uh, then I'm gonna <coughs> explain what the magnetic interactions and magnums are. And the second uh, part is also kind of a review, but I'm going to review what the magnum pole effect is. And the third and fourth parts are basically the main parts of my talk. And I'm going to introduce the notion of you know, magnetic analogs of two-dimensional and three-dimensional topological integrators. Right. Uh, okay, so what are topological inserters? And topological inserters are both almost like ordinary band inserters, but not right because you know they can carry contribute topological invariants, right? And perhaps the most famous example is you know <coughs> quantum power systems where you know each band carries pk and n invariant or you know charm it's the same but the charm number in mathematics. But you can see the difference between topological and ordinary in band inserters by just looking at the band structure. I mean, in both cases, you uh, should see this kind of, you know, variance band at the bottom and conduction band on the top. And uh, there's an energy gap between them. But uh, if you have a boundary in a sample, then <coughs> you see the edge state, you know, running from the variance band to the conduction band like this. And in real space, they look like this. So they look, they are localized around the boundary of the system. So, so this is the, the important consequence of the presence of non-trivial topological invariants. So uh, in topological insulators, you have robust gapless edge or surface state, and they are protected by, you know, these topological invariants. And you know, topological inserters are a little bit already a, a kind of old subject, and uh, there are already a lot of reviews and textbooks about them, and uh, kind of famous reviews in 
reviews of modern physics. You know, first, what is interesting here is, you know, these are not just theoretical toy models, but, you know, in, in the, there are many experimental realizations in nature. And, and the first example is, as I said, you know, integer quantum code effect is perhaps the first example of the logical integer. But the problem here is, you know, uh, we need to apply a strong <coughs> magnetic field, and we also need high two dimensionality here, right? But in 2005, Ken and Mere <coughs> came up with the idea to uh, hook up some model which looks a lot like uh, integer quantum forces, but uh, we don't need to break time reversal sy symmetry. But instead, uh, we, we need a, a spin orbit interaction. And this is what uh, people call two dimensional quantum hole effect. And, and after the theoretical proposal by Ken and Mele, uh, people uh, in all the group uh, experimentally, experimentally uh, realized the corresponding system. And uh, soon after the uh, proposal for two dimensional quantum hole system, uh, uh, people like Ken and Mele uh, came up with the idea to realize something similar in three-dimensional system, which is called the three-dimensional topological integrator. And this is the uh, crystal or bismuth uh, tailwind, and uh, uh, the surface from which people measured. Uh, okay, so this is the, the measurement, uh, our first measurement, and uh, people indeed found the derived form on the surface of this system. All right, so now the question is, you know, maybe you can ask how many different distinct topological phases you can in principle find in nature. And and this problem was uh, worked out by many people, including Kitai and others, and, and uh, without it summarized nicely in this table. And here, uh, what is important is the uh, presence or absence of symmetries, certain symmetries, and by PRS, I mean time reversal symmetry, and CHS is the particle of symmetry, and CHS denotes power symmetry. And in this table, you have 10 different classes, which is called the uh, Artran Zillenbauer uh, um, classes, and here are uh, Zero in the entries means the absence of the corresponding symmetry, and plus one or minus one means the corresponding symmetry operation squares to either <coughs> plus one or minus one. And and here a uh, little d means the spatial dimension, and uh, uh, if you don't have anything here, then this means you only. And I mean the only option is you only have trivial space, but uh, if you have d. Uh, sorry, C2 here, then uh, you have two distinct phases labeled by uh, the integer 0 or 1. And if it's Z, then you have, you know, I mean, distinct phases uh, labeled by just integers 0 plus 1 and so on. But if it's uh, 2Z, you have uh, different phases labeled by uh, even integers. And you see there's a, a beautiful pattern which is called a bot periodicity. Of course, you know, higher dimensional systems are kind of artificial, but uh, anyway, <clears throat> mathematically, you see this uh, periodicity in spatial dimension. And so known examples of topological instruments that fall into this table very nicely. And for instance, the <coughs> integer quantum power effect is, you know, occurs in two dimensions and uh, it's in class A. And the quantum spin core effect falls uh, on here, and uh, is in, in, in which case you have two different phases labeled by uh, logical invariant zero or one. And and this is the three D topological instrument, in which case you have Z two topological invariant, and so on. And you can uh, define this kind of table by adding some other symmetries like point group symmetries. Uh, space group symmetries and so on. But uh, anyway, so today I'm not going to talk about logical insulators, but I'm going to talk about uh, magnetic systems. Right? 
And now let me introduce the notion of magnet. But before that, let me first uh, quickly review what the magnetic interactions are. And as, as stressed in some of the previous talks, you know, I mean, the origin of magnetic interactions or ferromagnetism is kind of a hard thing stuff, right? I mean, it's not so easy to understand on first principle. But uh, you can see the uh, difficulty here. So if you, you know, what classical electromagnetism tells us is the following. So if there is a dipole-dipole uh, -dipole interaction between two different dipoles, mu one and mu two, and which looks like this. This is the Hamiltonian for the dipole dipole interaction. But usually, the energy scale of this interaction is too small to explain the transition temperatures of magnets, which is typically of the order of you know, a few hundred Kelvin. But then uh, Heisenberg came up with the idea to explain the magnetism by considering this kind of exchange interaction, which looks like this, so between two, uh, two spins. S SI and SJ, as I and J, uh, you have this kind of interaction called the exchange interaction. And if the sign of J is uh, negative, it's called direct exchange, in which case you, I mean, the ferromagnetic uh, you know, configuration is favored. On the other hand, if the sign of J is positive, it's called super exchange and, and uh, you know, anti ferromagnetic order is favored. But in reality, in nature, uh, you know, I mean, this interaction is SE2 invariant, but uh, in reality, you have uh, many other terms that breaks, you know, SE2 symmetry. And uh, this is a quite general form of the spin uh, spin interaction. You have, you know, an isotropic interaction, J, I mean, coefficient JX, JY, JZ. And uh, this term is called the Jorzinski Morier interaction. And if you have this kind of term, then you know things tend to be orthogonal, right? That's that's the energetically favored configuration. And and but the, for the presence of Jarzinski Moria interaction, the uh, inversion breaking is necessary. Anyway, so the Jarzinski Moria uh, interaction plays quite important role in my talk. So now, uh, but the two. But before explaining what the BM interaction is, so let me just uh, give you some, uh, I mean, quick idea about what's going on in the uh, magnetic system. And so actually, I have to admit that I'm not a BFT guy, I'm a more like a model calculation guy. So let me just start with the Hubbard model uh, for just for two sides. And if you uh, let's consider uh, these two sides, and you have, you know, electron at either on side one or side two, and this is the Hamiltonian for two sides, and the first term uh, means the Hawking term, I mean, with, with which you have a hop of electron between, I mean, you know, this guy is going back and forth between side one and side two like this. And the second term is the on-site Coulomb interaction. So in reality, Coulomb interaction has you know, a long-range tail, but uh, in, in this model, we consider some oversimplification, and we only consider the on-site on Coulomb interaction. And, and with this interaction, uh, if you have two electrons at side two like this, then uh, they feel uh, Coulomb repulsion <coughs> And then uh, let's consider uh, a case uh, where U is much larger than P. And let's consider the half feeding case, in which case you have two electrons in the system. And in this case, you have four different configurations like this, right? And then if you do the uh, second order perturbation here, uh, then uh, for this state, you know, this guy just, just can't you know, move to the right because of the power it brings down, right? So this hopping process doesn't happen here. But, uh, oh, sorry. But for this configuration, this guy can move to the right because, you know, they, they have different things, right? Then they give you uh, the power U, and then this guy can move back to the original position like this. And this is one process, but uh, there is another process, right? Because, um, sorry, I did. Okay. 
starting from this configuration, uh, this jelly can move to the right like this, but then this downstream electron uh, can go to the left like this. Then the final configuration is different from the original one. And we can do something similar for the third state. And then uh, this is your effective hamiltonian obtained after the second order perturbation theory. And this is just a four by four matrix, and you can just fit it by, you know, uh, spin operators like this. So here by SI alpha, I mean the one half times sigma i alpha. This is just nothing but just the power matrix. And you can uh, fit this four by four matrix in this curve, and then you will get the uh, super exchange in, I mean, interaction as a function of P of P and U. And, and this is a crude explanation for the presence of super exchange interaction in this, you know, strongly polarized system. And this can explain the antiferromagnetic interaction. But uh, because, you know, when U is positive, this is always positive, right? So this means uh, you can only get the antiferromagnetic interaction. And in fact, the origin of ferromagnetic interaction is much more subtle. And we need to consider multi orbital nature, and uh, there's a, a known kind of semi empirical rules for the canonical good enough rules. So, but in any case, ferromagnetic interaction is more complicated. But uh, I mean, what I wanted to say is this way you can see that the interaction is important to understand the origin of magnetism, right? So now let's. Uh, we'll move on to the origin of Jaroszynski Moria interaction. So let's again consider some kind of uh, Hubbard like model. But here, uh, I mean, if you have an inversion symmetry about the uh, bond center here, then the popping doesn't depend on the spin. However, uh, if you break inversion symmetry like this, you know, here you, you have a bend here, right? But uh, let's just keep the time reversal symmetry. If that's the case, then the hopping which, uh, could depend on spin. I mean, there's a spin dependent hopping and spin flipping hopping here. And this uh, T matrix is uh, uh, that spin dependent hopping. But uh, you can derive this T matrix in this form. And here, uh, T naught is just a constant, and uh, T is a three dimensional vector, the meaning of it become clear in the next page. And then this sigma is just a vector of R matrices. And as you see, theta equals zero reduces to the in independent case. And now let's consider uh, the following unitary transformation. You can actually absorb this spin, in, spin dependent hopping. Uh, in this question. So this CI is two component phenol like this, and I, I denote sites one or two. And now let's define new set of fermions. So F1 is just the same as C1, but F2 is defined as a unitary transformation of C2. Then uh, you can easily check that these new fermions also satisfy the same anti commutation duration. So you can think of this F1 and F2 as, you know, just usual fermion operators. And, and you can also check that the number of operators look, I mean, look the same, right? So, so yeah. Uh, all these uh, counts with exponential count counts, what is the reason? Oh, oh, yeah, that's a good question. So actually, uh, I, I'm not really sure if these two conditions uh, really specify this form. But uh, for instance, maybe you can just consider some, uh, I mean, concrete example like a Rashiba type interaction, in which case you can indeed write the whole thing in this form. Yeah. Yeah, let's just consider that uh, concrete case. But in any case, yeah, let's just focus on this particular case. And then uh, in terms of new fermions, F1 and F2, the Hamiltonian looks like this. And what is interesting here is 
you know, in terms of this fermion, the Hamiltonian is nothing but the, you know, covered Hamiltonian. Uh, I mean, with just in, independent of it. Then, if you do the second order perturbation here, then you will end up with the, just the, you know, Heisenberg Hamiltonian in terms of new spins, right? But here, the, the big difference is this S2. S1 tilde and S2 tilde are defined in terms of new fermions F1 and F2. Of course, if S1 tilde, S1 tilde is the same as S1, but S2 tilde is a bit different. And so, what is the physical interpretation of this new fermion? Okay, no, no, this is just a mathematical <laughs> trick. And uh, uh, actually, what I'm going to do here is uh, I will rewrite uh, this Hamiltonian in terms of original. And as I said, S1 tilde is the same as S1, but S2 tilde looks a bit more complicated because of the unitary transformation we did. But uh, using some nice identity for R matrices, you can rewrite this S2 tilde in terms of the original S2 in this fashion. But uh, now you have, you know, this, I mean, X, I mean, uh, cross products and uh, sub products like this. And then if you uh, put this into this uh, you know, equation one, then you will get the uh, effective Hamiltonian in terms of the original spins S1 and S2. Now, what is interesting is now you have, you know, the first term is nothing but the Heisenberg interaction, but the second term looks like the jaroszynski moria interaction, right? And in this case, the DM uh, vector D is related to the D vector, which parameterizes the hopping matrix. And the last one is called the uh, KSE interaction, but uh, yeah, if you, for, for instance, if D vector is parallel to the Z axis, then this is just the XXZ like anisotropy. An and so you can actually eliminate uh, these, you know, complicated looking interaction by doing you know the other way around right if you do the inverse unitary transformation you can eliminate this uh complicated interaction but you can do that if you have uh, loops like you know triangle or square like this but anyway this is a, a kind of a good explanation for the uh the derivation of jarosinski moria interaction Okay, now let me move on to explain the uh, explaining the what the magnons are. But before that, let's consider the ground state of the ferromagnetic Heisenberg model. And this is the Hamiltonian of the Heisenberg model in the field, magnetic field. And the first term is the Heisenberg ferromagnetic interaction, and the second one is the magnetic field term. And uh, uh, if J is positive, then the ground the ground state is nothing but the ferromagnetic state in which all the spins are aligned in the same direction, right? And in this case, we have this ground state energy. And then you can consider elementary excitation above this ferromagnetic state. And, okay, so this is a, a more intuitive picture of what's going on here. And the ground state, as I said, looks like this. And uh, in this, you know, line model picture, uh, this state corresponds to some point on the uh, de degenerate ground state manifold. And the excitation, which is nothing but the non ghost model mode, looks like this. So it's a, you know, fluctuation around the order direction. And uh, in this picture, uh, this mode corresponds to the fluctuation around this point like this. But this is just the cartoon picture. Uh, oh, in this case, you have a K square dispersion. But uh, in ferromagnets, you know, ground state and one magnon states are exact eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. So let me explain what it means. It's actually important. And so, as I said, this is the, let's just consider one dimensional case for simplicity, and this is our ferromagnetic ground state. And let's consider a state in which the, the ice spin is flipped like this. And, and this is what I denote by pi k. But what is important is this 
Ah, it's, it's not an eigenstate of the Heisenberg Hamiltonian. This is because, you know, you can decompose this Heisenberg interaction uh, between psi i and j in this fashion, right? And as plus minus are uh, raising and lowering operators on spins, and if you act with the first time here on this configuration, i down j up, then you will get another state, right? Uh, up, down. And, and actually, uh, I mean, this way you can, uh, you know, take the downspin here to the right, like this. And this is the corresponding equation. And you can keep going like this, right? If you act on the, let's say, Sj plus S something minus here, then you will get another configuration. So this way, uh, flip spin comes to the neighboring side, looking around the neighboring side neighboring sides like this. Now you can consider the prop state of this uh, flip spin. And this is the just the uh, definition. And if you can see that this is an exact eigenstate of the Heisenberg Hamiltonian. And and if you put this into the uh, shredding equation, then you will get this dispersion duration. It's uh, just a cosine dispersion and the magnetic field uh, here corresponds to the, the energy gap. And, and this is the magnum excitation for just a simple Heisenberg metal magnet. But if you have, so what if you have Chelsinski Moria interaction? In this case, uh, okay, let's suppose D vector is parallel to the D axis. In this case, you can rewrite this interaction in this question. And, and if you actually have the phase factor here. Uh, and this phi is related to the ratio between D and J, like this. And, and in this case, actually, magnum, this, this guy, yeah, if you think of the, you know, down spin as a particle, then this guy picks up a phase half factor uh, e to the minus phi part here. Okay, so as I said, uh, I mean, the rough picture of magnons is like this. So if they are just a, a quantization of the fluctuation around the ferromagnetic configuration. But you can do something more systematic by considering the first time pre Markov transformation. So let me explain what it is. So uh, this D and D dagger are uh, bosom annihilation and fluidation operators, and they obey this. Uh, canonical and uh, commutation relations, and by n i, I mean the number of operators. And you can express spin operators s plus s minus and s b in terms of this b b dagger and n. And you can see that these uh, operators obey the same commutations of those of spin. But but because of this square root part, uh, you will have some nonlinear terms in terms of n. But in many cases, uh, we can neglect uh, those nonlinear terms, and you can think of this as just a number, square root to s. And, and this is just justified at low temperature, uh, in which case, you know, uh, magnum density is very low. And and this picture magnetic ground state corresponds to the vacuum of bosons. So B annihilates the uh, magnetically ordered state. And in but uh, if you have more complicated, you know, magnetically ordered state like anti-ferromagnetic state, you need to introduce uh, some other uh, boson species and and for instance, in the antiferromagnetic case, you need to introduce other boson A's on the other sub lattice. In this case, for instance, in this case, uh, B raises SD, but A lowers SD. But in any case, uh, um, I mean, in this way, you can do uh, systematically drive uh, spin wave Hamiltonian in terms of these bosons. Okay, now, um, uh, so this is the way to diagonalize the spin wave Hamiltonian. So after the spin wave approximation, you will end up with the quadratic form of bosons like this, right? And in general, you have uh, 
the pairing terms like he, B, and B, data, B, data, but in the ferromagnetic case, uh, these delta and delta star are vanishing. And uh, then the uh, diagonalization boils down to the, just the diagonalization of this matrix state. And this is most easily done in case space. If you go to, you know, case space, it's almost diagonal, right? So, by the way, so here, uh, by these, I mean the bosons in the real space. And, but the, um, um, the situation is more complicated if you consider anti ferromagnetic or more general cases. Because in this case, you need to use other unitary matrix to diagonalize. Uh, this you know, second quantized Hamiltonian. And uh, by para unitary matrix, I mean this kind of matrix, which is uh, invariant, uh, sorry, which gives sigma three invariant, like this. And, and this transformation, para unitary transformation, leaves the bottom condensation unchanged. That's the important point, because, you know, this Hamiltonian itself is a mission can diagonalize this by unitary transformation, but the unitary tr transformation, uh, you know, mixed up B and B dagger, and uh, after the unitary transformation, this op I mean, the new operators uh, don't have to obey the canonical commutation duration, but if you use the other unitary matrix, then you can ensure the boson commutation duration. And after uh, this transformation, then you will end up with this uh, diagonal matrix. And you have, uh, I mean, energy eigenvalues on diagonal. And so it's a little bit complicated, but uh, there's a, a old paper by Popper in which uh, he considered, uh, I mean, he explained these procedures very uh, precisely. All right, so now uh, let's uh, come back to the uh, original issue. So, so you know, electrons are fundamental particles, elementary particles, and they carry electric charge in the energy. On the other hand, uh, magnons are not fundamental particles, but quasi particles, and they don't carry electric charge, right? They are charge neutral, but they can carry energy. So let's now compare the situations for electron systems and magnetic systems. So for electron systems, people have found many different distinct topological phases, right? And in 2D, people found, for instance, Chan insulator and quantum spin four insulators. And for the Chan insulator, what is interesting is we have quantized all effects, which means that we have different phases, topological phases uh, labeled by Z, integer Z. And in the spin four, case, you have two distinct phases labeled by zero over one. And in, in 3D, uh, you have topological insulators with time reversal symmetries and uh, those with crystal symmetry. And what is interesting here is, I mean, the consequence of topological invariance here is you have a direct surface state. But the match rest is known, explored for magnum systems. And and corresponding to the channels that uh, we have thermal for, uh, I mean the magnum for systems in which we have thermal for effect, and in this case each magnum band can carry a uh, channel number, but uh, actually in this case the thermal for coefficient is isn't quantized because of the you know bottom statistics, so there is no notion of Fermi energy here, right? But uh, mathematically, you can still define, you know, channel number for each magnum band. But the question now I want to address is uh, what are counterparts for magnum? So what, what are counterparts of these, you know, uh, these two topological interests for magnum? And what are uh, topological invariants? So the definition of topological invariants for them. And, and this was actually what I did with my student others, and for, for, for the two, sorry, quantum spin for interest, uh, uh, they were already some um, work. But uh, in, in this work, they didn't really explicitly write down the 
the formula for the C2 invariant, but we did that in this paper. And for 3D control training, we did uh, in this paper. So, but the, okay, so the important point here is, I mean, important point here is uh, what's the appropriate time reversal <laughs> symmetry for magnum? Because, you know, magnetic systems already break time reversal symmetry, right? But uh, for, for the, uh, this is logical invariant to make sense. We need some appropriate and reversal symmetry for the quasi particle Hamiltonian. <coughs> okay, so that's the question I want to address, but I think I spent too much time. But uh, okay, let me go to the second part. So, how, how many minutes do I have? More than 30, right? Yeah. Now let's move on to the uh, second part and uh, let me explain what the magnum force effect is. Okay. Now, uh, yeah, thank you. And okay. Now, uh, yeah, in this part, I'm going to introduce the notion of thermal force effect and what the magnum chan insulators are. Okay, so I think I can skip this first because the Jason already explained uh, about this. But uh, to just fix the notation, let me just uh, just read it. So, so by side n k, side n of k, I mean the block wave function of n span at momentum k, and by a sub n of k, I mean the very connection defined uh, this way. So by by the way, this is uh, by this I mean the uh, Scalar product between two vectors, and by omega n of k, I mean the very curvature. And and this is what people call the TKNN order for the Chan number, and n is uh, uh, defined by the uh, sum over sum of the integral over the Euclidean zone of the uh, very curvature omega n of k. <laughs> And as he explained in the previous talk, so uh, this number uh, is quantized, and as a conse consequence, we have the quantized whole conductor sigma x y, uh, which is quantized in the unit of e square over h. And and here's the example which I also explained in the previous talk, but uh, Oden came up with the idea to, you know. Uh, could have some model in which shows the anomalous whole effect even without the magnetic field. <coughs> and, but uh, as he also told us, so this is a little bit artificial model, right? You have a, a near, next nearest neighbor uh, complex hopping, but uh, Bushi Murakami and Nada also uh, considered a bit more uh, natural model, which is a, a similar uh, type binding model on the Kagome vertices, which could be derived from the W exchange model. All right, so now, uh, okay, what's the sum of all effect? And, and it's also called the Riggi deduct effect, so let me explain what, what it is. So suppose you have a, a System like this, and uh, you're applying the magnetic field <coughs> in this direction, and uh, you also let the energy current flow in this x direction. Then uh, you have temperature gradient in this y direction. This is what, uh, what is called the Rigi reduced effect or thermal hole effect. So, which means tran transverse temperature gradient is produced in response to the heat current. And in itinerant electron systems, this is quite natural because in those systems we have we demand France law, which states that there is a relation between the uh, I mean, thermal conductivity and the uh, electric conductivity. And this L is for the uh, Lorentz number, which is kind of universal number, and T is the temperature. And and this is just the effect that for, for non-interacting bosons, you can derive uh, the formula for Kappa X5, which looks something similar to TKNN formula. And uh, 
I I am K. I'm in the drop wave function of bosom and epsilon n of K is the energy band and the omega n of K is the very curvature. And we derived some formula for the couple uh, x y in some earlier work, but there were some problems. And later on, people fixed the problem, and then uh, I mean the finally Matsumoto and Murakami. Uh, on the correct formula for the copper x y. And here's the formula, and you have, I mean, it looks like a lot like the TKNN formula for the channel number, but here you have some partition uh, which is related to the temperature. But uh, uh, this omega is nothing but the daily curvature. And C2 rho is something complicated looking function, but uh, anyway. So this is the function of the Bose distribution. So rho n of k is the Bose distribution function. But because we are involving the Bose di distribution here, uh, it's not quantized. But anyway, so mathematically, the formula looks a lot like the TKNN problem, right? Now, uh, let me just apply this formula to some uh, explicit example. And the uh, model we consider in the uh, in our first paper was the carbon and ferromagnet with Jarsensky in the rear interactions. So the carbon that this means uh, this kind of bodies. And here uh, by symmetry you have these Jarsensky Morir. I mean these Jarsensky Morir interactions are allowed. I mean uh, by this I mean the D and vector pointing in this direction perpendicular to this. And these are errors in the sign convention. So, for instance, uh, if I, side I is here and side J is here, then you have a positive D vector in this direction. And if you go to the uh, bottom basis, then this interaction looks like this. So, so you have a, a complex hopping on each bone. And, and here, uh, this phase factor phi is related to the ratio, I mean, d over j. And interestingly, uh, if you go to the uh, boson model, uh, I mean, the boson model is just a hopping model with that pattern. And this is actually nothing but the bosonic version of Paul Lucic's model. And in, in, the, in his model, uh, I mean, each band carries a non-trivial uh, very curvature and the uh, chan number. So non-trivial couple x, y is also expected in this bosonic model, so which I have done in our paper. But, but uh, at that moment, uh, I just thought this is just a kind of toy model. But interestingly, uh, experimental people practice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, just, uh, yeah, exactly. But the electronic contribution of the thermal. No, 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 no. I, I'm just considering purely uh, bosonic contribution. So, but it, there is nothing coming from phono. That's what I mean. Ah, so oh, like oh, electron, that's you a... have converted to the spin because you are considering the spin model, but there is no phonon contribution. Actually, that's a good question. So, in reality, I think both <laughs> phonons and magnets yeah. contribute, yeah. but uh, yes, in this. Over simplified model, I just considered magnum contribution. Because in experiment, of course, the, you cannot get rid of this. But uh, what is a bit subtle is, I mean, for for magnums, we we are sure that this DM interaction plays the role of this kind of gauge graph. But for phonons, we are not very sure what the origin of the. So you need the octagonal component, which is the xy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, the phonon contribution probably will not be there or. But the situation is not that simple because uh, for phonons and people, before the magnum hole effect, people already discussed the phonon hole effect. In which case, I mean, people, uh, I mean, consider that the origin was something like. Uh, uh, yeah, maybe I can wait. <clears throat> and that 
context people consider something like uh, uh, m dot s, but uh, I think so. so it's basically just a spin optic interaction, but this s is the spin of localized things, but uh, this l is angular momentum of phonon. People consider something like that. Mm -hmm. But the problem is, you know, uh, this is a little bit weird interaction, and it's not so easy to really, you know, identify the, I mean, determine the strength of this interaction. Right? But uh, once you assume this kind of form, then you can also derive something like uh, this kind of formula. I mean, the sum of all, you can derive the sum of all conductivity. And and in the other, and in the other, there must be a mixing between phonons and spin uh, magnons, and that makes uh, things more complicated. So anyway, so uh, coming back to this Kagome model, what is interesting was people found something similar to this kind of toy model. And that's the uh, metal organic framework materials. And in this case, uh, spins are carried by the copper two cross moment. And, and this is the experimental result. And as a, I mean, the copper XY as a function of temperature. And uh, people indeed found some uh, non zero uh, copper XY in, in certain temperature, very low temperature region. And, uh, it's a little bit puzzling point because the uh, kappa xy shows some sign change, but uh, uh, there are some work, theoretical work which address this sign change. But anyway, so, uh, okay, now let me uh, show some other results for uh, the pyrogra ferromagnet. Actually, that's the reason why I'm wearing the t shirt of the pipe floor. And uh, so, so, okay. And actually, this is the first material in which people uh, indeed observe the thermal flow effect of magnum. And in this material, uh, vanadium phosphorus ion carries in one half. And uh, uh, I mean, this is the electric configuration, the electronic configuration, but because of the orbital order, uh, I mean, each electron at this site occupies this A1G orbital, and which are also confirmed by. Uh, neutron diffraction experiment. And these are some uh, basic physical properties of the system. And uh, this shows the magnetization curve. And uh, below 70 Kelvin, uh, you are in a ferromagnetic phase. And this is the resistivity. And you see it's quite resistive. So it's a good insulator. And, and this is the longitudinal thermal conductivity. And uh, I mean, from this, you can estimate the electric ele electron contribution to the longitudinal conductivity, which is quite smaller than the observed one. So you can conclude that uh, this kappa XX is mainly, uh, I mean, carried by magnons and phonons. And this is the magnetization curve, and you see it's uh, more or less isotropic. I mean, doesn't much depend on the magnet magnetic field direction. And the final one is the specific key, and uh, you can uh, fit it very well by the phonon and magnon contribution. So in this case, as she said, you know, uh, in reality, we have both phonon and magnon. And okay, so this is the result for the sum of both conductivity, copper XY, zero TC, and you see, uh, zero TC, we have clear uh, signature of some of all effect, right? And it, what is interesting is, you know, for instance, in this case, we we have non non zero kappa x by even in the zero field limit. So it's you know it's kind of anomalous some of all effect. And it seems uh, you know it's related to the time reversal symmetry work. Right? Okay, now the question how can we 
understand these, you know, non-trivial sum of four effects. And and here's the model that can explain the result. And uh, let's consider that just a simple Heisenberg interaction plus the Jasinski Moriac interaction plus the magnetic field term. And from the inversion symmetry, you can fix the allowed dn vectors. So once you uh, fix the dn vector here, then the, uh, the dn vectors on the other bonds are automatically determined by the symmetry, inversion symmetry about this point. And you can also prove the stability of the ferromagnetic ground, ground state against jasinski moria interaction. This is because, yeah, let's just suppose this kind of ferromagnetic border here, and then if you tilt, tilt this in a little bit, then, uh, you know, this is, uh, this costs some energy for the Heisenberg interaction, but this doesn't cost the energy for the Jarsinski Moriel interaction because the sum of these vectors just vanish, which means the ferromagnetic configuration is stable. So sufficiently small Jarsinski Moriel interaction. Now let's uh, uh, derive the spin wave Hamiltonian. So if you uh, just consider this ordered state, and then if you do the spin wave approximation, then you will end up with this uh, moment. Uh, you can, if you go to the momentum space, you will get a uh, four by four matrix Hamiltonian. And uh, here, for simplicity, I just consider the dm vector, which is parallel to the uh, uh, magnetic order direction theater. And uh, in, in case space, Hamiltonian looks like this. And as I said, it's a uh, four by four matrix. And in the absence of the jarsinski moria interaction, the magnum band looks like this. So you have quadratic band around gamma point, and you have two flat bands at the top. But in the presence of the jarsinski moria interaction, these degeneracies will be thick, and uh, 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 you have a little bit different uh, band structure. But anyway, around the gamma point, you have a quadratic dispersion. Now, uh, yeah. So this flat band comes because of uh, in, uh, x in w, you have a complete flat. Oh, here. Uh, so this is because of which is fit? Uh, not sure. So for the top front, um, uh, you can explain this from a general theory, but uh, this one, I'm not sure. But in any case, if you just introduce the Jarosinski Moriel interaction, this uh, front bands are just going away. So this is a spin wave spectra. Yeah, yeah, exactly. For a Kagome system, right? No, no, no. Pyroplot. Pyroplot. Okay. In, in plane, it's a pyroplot, right? So it's a tetrahedra. Yeah, exactly. So, so uh, how many uh, branches are there here? Oh, four branches. So, so but uh, these two are the general. Okay, the flat band. Because for Kagome, you have three. Yeah, yeah. One is flat, and one has a dark one. Right. right. So now you say for pyroplot, you have four. Okay, and who are flat and one right? Yeah, actually there is a direct relation between the band structure for pyroplore and band structure for the diamond ones. Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. So you can think of these two bands as the band, bands of di diamond ones. Mm -hmm. So here you are still the calculation is only in the limit of either mean field or just the hopping down you are taking? It's just a spin rate with approximation. Just a spin rate. So no, in, in no. some sense, it's already, I already used the mean field, right? Because I already assumed the ground right. state, yeah. magnetic ground state. So, so, so mostly mean field level. Right, right, right. So anyway, so by using the formula that I showed you before, uh, you can compute the sum and four effect. And what is nice here is actually in, in this particular model, you can compute the uh, daily curvature around the uh, gamma point analytically, and then if you just assume some low temperature ap approximation, then you can derive copper XY analytically. And, and this is the comparison between the, uh, I mean, 
theoretical result and experiment. And, and because the only parameter uh, coming into the formula is just the ratio P over J. So, I mean, the just system real interaction is the only fitting parameter. And the, the, this fit is uh, this kind of ratio. And uh, I must say, this is uh, too large, but uh, yes. maybe it's not. Maybe I can say it's not unreasonable right? because I, what I did use was quite good approximation. I mean, this is already approximate, and uh, I, I already used a low temperature approximation. So, in that sense, it's not that unreasonable, but I have to admit it's too large. But, uh, for instance, in this material, uh, they also estimated something similar. And this is a pilot core anti ferrovacuum. Yeah, I was just about to ask that question because you should have some kind of synovic to get your yeah, yeah, yeah. feedback. Right, right. And these are all vanadium. So maybe the synovic is not so large. Yeah, maybe I the agree. The G is small, I don't know. Because you are just computing the ratio, and I'm not sure how is the G. But actually, uh, yeah, let me just show you some other materials. And in these materials, uh, I mean, the, this estimate is more reasonable, like a point or three or something. Somehow, for this uh, and particular system, somehow we have quite huge just system area interaction. But I'm not very sure what's the reason. I mean, but the one reason could be because, you know, I just did quite approximation yeah so but, but as far in this you know in reality the KXY would have as you said phonons as well as uh, the background contribution do you think the phonon contribution here is uh, large or, or or is that what we call it you know so here I completely ignore the phonon contribution in this calculation but if we see the uh, if we see the CP your most dominant contribution is coming from But, uh, okay, so, but uh, at that time, what we thought was, you know, for, for phonons, the, the origin of the thermal polyphyl is this kind of interaction, but uh, if you apply a magnetic field, then this uh, somehow the fracturation of this is, you know, quite suppressed. That's why I thought common contribution is smaller than those of from magnums. But what, that's, what it's a little bit, you know, hand waving argument. What I is agree. the value of J? Your J value? Uh, oh, in this material? Yeah. I haven't. Uh, I don't remember, but the, the, the transition temperature is 70 Kelvin, so maybe you can estimate. Oh, that's it's not so small. Not so small. Okay, so we <laughs> ask. Yeah. But anyway, uh, and in some materials, uh, we also observe the similar thermal void effect. But in, in this particular material, uh, uh, sorry, in these materials, uh, we, we we couldn't see the kappa x y. And this is consistent with the uh, Jarosinski Moria scenario because if you, uh, in these systems, uh, if you naively assume some kind of type binding, like, sorry, sorry like a spring wave of uh, Hamiltonian, then you can prove that the very curvature is zero in these systems. So, yeah, I spent too much time on the summer uh, fall effect, but uh, let's just skip it. But uh, there are many other ecological bottom systems, but uh, let's just focus on the uh, magnetic analog of 2D ecological insulators now. Okay, so now let's consider magnetic analog topological insulators. And uh, but before that, let me just uh, quickly review the gamma spheres and D2 invariant for electrons. And yeah, I think I should skip this. Okay, so anyway, this is the uh, most general form of the quadratic Hamiltonian for electrons, and uh, you can get the eigenvalues, eigenenergies by just diagonalizing this you know, uh, matrix. 
And if you have time reversal symmetry, then uh, the, this part satisfies this relation, right? I mean, theta sends hk to h of minus k. And this theta is the product of unitary and complex conjugation, and it's anti unitary, and the standard choice is this i sigma by tensor i n. And this part is the minus one. And if you have this kind of symmetry, so the chunky, uh, you should you should have the grammar specificity, and this is the proof. But uh, let me just skip. Uh, I, I think it's standard, right? <coughs> and, and in the presence of time with reversal symmetry, you can prove the orthogonality of the time reversal invariant momentum. So this psi k and psi k are eigen vectors of h of k, and and, and reversal invariant momenta like uh, these four points in this particular two-dimensional case, you can prove the orthogonality of these vectors by just using uh, this relation. And let me, I think I should skip it. Yeah, but uh, anyway, so I think this is also Related to the previous law, but uh, for in the presence of time reversal symmetry, you have a pair of uh, bands which, which is related to each other by the time reversal operation. And this A and alpha of K is the daily connection for, and, and the alpha labels give these things directed by the time reversal operation, and this is the daily curvature. And by then, you can press the D2 index. And as he also explained, uh, this, this can be explained by uh, in this form, right? Uh, I mean, this effective brilliant zone is half of the, the entire brilliant zone. And this, I mean, green part and white part are derided to each other by time reversal operation. And uh, this uh, D2 index. Uh, in this formula, the first part is the integral over the green part, and but the second, uh, sorry, sorry, the second part is the integral over the green part, but the first part is the line integral over along this thick line. And 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 this is quanta is to be zero or one, one or two. And okay, I think I should skip it. Okay, now my question is what is the magnetic analog of topological interest in two dimensions? And so now I consider anti ferromagnetically coupled two dimensional ferromagnet. And up and down electrons uh, in electron systems correspond to magnets at layer one and layer two. And Here's a schematic picture of magnets in Nernst's effect. And on the top layer, things are pointing down, but on the bottom layer, things are pointing up. And uh, these are, I mean, independent magnet power systems. And on the top layer, if you apply uh, temperature gradient in this direction, uh, I mean, heat current flows like this on the top layer, but on the bottom layer, heat uh, current uh, flows like this. And between the layers, you have anti ferromagnetic interaction. And on the top layer, uh, magnets are flowing like this. And, and in, in this case, uh, the energy current flows to the right, and the spin up component flows to the so, sorry, left. And on the bottom layer, uh, the energy current is flowing on the opposite direction, but the spin component flows on the same direction, in the same direction. So, I mean, between the two layers, the energy current cancels out, but uh, you have a finite uh, spin current in this direction. And this is what people call the magnum spin dance effect uh, proposed in these papers. And, but the question is, uh, what is the pseudo time reversal symmetry in this kind of time reversal symmetry in this system? 
You see, it, this system is invariant under the time reversal plus the interchange of the wave. And in these papers, uh, I think they consider some, I mean, something like a spin channel number, which is the difference of the channel number for spin up and so that for the spin down. But uh, you can uh, define uh, the Z2 invariant more precisely by considering the pseudo time reversal symmetry here. And okay, so but be before explaining the uh, what the the invariant in this system is, let's consider uh, a general bosonic quadratic form. And this is the momentum space uh, expression for the Hamiltonian, and data k is the set of bosonic operators, b up and b down. And I mean, here up and down denote the two, two layers, layer in labels. And, and, and for each b, you have n components. <laughs> And by the color unitary transformation, you can the abnormalize this matrix. And after that, you will end up with this the abnormal matrix. And uh, you have eigen energies on the abnormal. And, but uh, actually, these uh, eigenvalues are actually the eigenvalues of sigma z times h of k. So it's actually non permission, right? So, so to get the eigenvalues of this uh, system, you need to diagonalize one emission Hamilton. So, and actually, uh, because of this, we have to consider a modified inner product. So here, uh, psi and phi are basically eigenvectors of sigma z h of k. But uh, if you naively consider uh, you know, standard scalar product between the vectors, then uh, that's not very good. But uh, instead, we should consider something like this. So you need to insert sigma z here. And so it's a little bit technical, so uh, I don't want to go into the details, but uh, by this, you can, uh, I mean, what I wanted to say is uh, to define very curvature, very connection, and so on, you should use this modified in a product. You shouldn't use the standard in a product. And if you do that, then, uh, okay. So, and if you do that, you can prove uh, something like grammar's degeneracy in the bosonic system. And, but uh, instead of the, just the time reversal symmetry, let's consider pseudo time reversal symmetry, which is defined by the product of P and K. And K is just a complex concept, but P is some parallel unitary matrix. And for instance, uh, this is one example of this pseudo time reversal symmetry. And this sigma z acts on the particle pole space and i sigma y uh, rips up and down layers, but uh, it has an extra sign arising from this i sigma y. And, and by uh, this theta prime sends uh, this sigma z h of k to sigma z h of minus k. And it can also prove this kind of nice property for the inner product. And then uh, you can show that you have something similar to the Kramer's degeneracy in electron system. And actually, this theta prime derates, I mean, the degenerate eigenstates of uh, this sigma z h of k. And this way, you can introduce nice uh, kind of time reversal symmetry for bosonic systems. And what is nice is this uh, theta prime squares to minus one. And, and then uh, now you can define the Z2 topological invariant for magnum systems, or in general, bosonic systems. And here, uh, Okay, so I, I don't think I have much time, but uh, anyway, the important point here is, you know, it almost, it's almost like ordinary very connection and very curvature, but not quite because we need to use a modified in the product. But uh, if you do that, then the formula is almost like the same. We just need to use this uh, new in the product. And, if, and then you can just, uh, computer z to invariant for a particular model, but by just using uh, 
numerical implementation proposed by Puri and others that you know Jason also explained in the previous talk. And so okay now uh, let me finally explain uh, some explicit examples. And we in, in our paper we can tell Kagome and Hanikam uh, by their system and in the Kagome case you have uh, I mean up stains on the bottom layer and uh, down stains on the top layer, and in between you have anti-ferromagnetic interactions. And in each layer you have ferromagnetic near neighbor interaction and a DM interaction. And in the honeycomb case, uh, it's actually uh, ferromagnetic in each layer, but anti-ferromagnetic uh, between the layers. And in this case, uh, I mean. For both cases, the system are uh, invariant under the time reversal plus the exchange of layers. And in this case, uh, the pseudo time reversal operation looks like this. And you can uh, check that this guy squares to minus one. And, and here's the uh, result I mean, for the edge spectrum. And these uh, black uh, ones are the Bulk bound spectrum, and uh, you see this. Uh, 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 yeah, these red ones are the edge spectrum, and you, you can compute uh, Z2 invariant for each band, and uh, uh, these are the uh, Z2 invariant. So you have one zero one, and uh, between the uh, maximum bands with different uh, Z2 invariants, you see. Uh, you know, this edge stage, right? And in this case, actually, it's a little bit tricky point. So we should consider some kind of fictitious pyramid energy, and then you need to add these E's up, up to the fictitious pyramid energy. And if that's the case, you know, if you consider some fictitious pyramid energy here, then uh, you have one, but uh, if you consider here, then you have uh, one plus one is you know zero module two, right? So in this case, uh, uh, you have net space between the uh, two different bands, and 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 this way in these explicit examples, you see the presence or absence of the edge states is one in one to one correspondence with the non-trivial, uh, you know, topological digital topological invariant, right? And I, I think I'm running out of time, right? Five more minutes. Five more minutes. So let me just go through quickly the last part. So, so actually, uh, I have to admit that these models are rather artificial. But uh, what I want, to, what, what I want to say in the last part is that uh, there are more realistic examples in 3D. And, and actually, but uh, what? I think my, my student first came up with it quite artificial. He considers something which is a magnonic analog of UK Merrill model. And he considered, uh, I mean, phylocoral pi pi lattice from which you have two spins at each side. And they are anti ferromagnetically coupled, but uh, between the uh, different sides, you have ferromagnetic interaction. And the model he came up with is quite you know complicated so you don't have to remember I mean maybe you just you can't even see these situations but anyway so you have this uh, complicated looking interaction but the uh, point is that uh, we just wanted to mimic this two can male model as much as possible that's why we have to introduce quite complicated interaction but then uh, if you do the spin wave approximation for this Hamiltonian, then uh, I mean you, you can define something similar to the who can make a model for electronic systems. And in 3D, actually, the things are more complicated because you can define many a set of uh, different D2 invariants. And for instance, if you consider uh, this, you know, uh, YZ frame, and then if you consider this half gradient zone, then you can define this D2 invariant for this frame. And you can do something similar for the other frame, right? Like this. 
this is essentially the same as the uh, invariant for the two dimensional case, but uh, in 3D, you just have too many uh, independent frames. But the uh, point is, these are not totally independent, only all of them are independent. And this is uh, a public, uh, I mean, a common choice. And the strong maximum topological instrument refers to the case where uh, this new knot, which is the sum of new plus new x i, is one module two. And and then uh, we work out the phrase diagram and j zero and j one are some anisotropic nearest neighbor interaction and we uh, uh, figure out the phase diagram as a function of j naught and j one. And, uh, and indeed, we have some strong background topological insert phase here. And for instance, at this point, if you compute the uh, surface magnum spectrum, then you indeed have this you know, Dirac magnum spectrum around the M2 point. But uh, I have to admit that the model here is quite artificial. But then uh, my student uh, came up with a better idea. Uh, which uses the kind of uh, non symmorphic symmetry. So instead of considering the pseudo time reversal symmetry, you can consider the combination of time reversal plus uh, half the um, unistyle translation. And this was actually considered for electron systems by Roger Mon and others. And, and if you consider this SK, uh, this guy squares to minus one when k3 is zero. On the other hand, and, and, this, and then uh, on this frame, you have a, you receive Ramas degeneracy. But for magnum systems, you can consider something similar. Uh, but uh, in this case, uh, this SK squares to minus one for the frame k3 equal five. And actually, uh, we have our, uh, material realization here. Uh, and this is the uh, Van der Waals magnet uh, chromium iodide, triiodide. And uh, this guy has different, I mean, phases, but in, in one phase, uh, it takes monoclinic stacking, uh, looking like this. And people, uh, I think DFT people work at uh, how, how the uh, model Hamiltonian looks like in this system. And you have uh, these items of GF, T type, and uh, more complicated interactions. But uh, actually, this system, uh, I mean, satisfied uh, this uh, combination of symmetry. <laughs> and then uh, this is the surface magnum spectrum. And it's really uh, difficult to see, but these are uh, little tiny gap here. But uh, around the M2 point, you indeed have some. Yeah. Okay, so I think I should stop here, but uh, let me summarize my talk. So I have reviewed uh, magnum flow effect, and I, I have proposed magnetic analogs of Z2 topological insulators in two dimension and three dimension, and uh, I have introduced Kuken uh, like formula for for magnum and bosonic systems, and there's a one to one correspondence between the uh, non trivial D2 invariance and the presence or absence of H surface space. So, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, I think that's a very nice talk. So, uh, one question was by Donosri Ma'am. So, she told that. Uh, in thermal conductivity, you don't know the how much contribution is coming from the magnon and from the spinner. So, but in harmonic system, where experimentalists uh, are doing that, they just create the resistivity data, and from there they are saying that how much contribution from the extrinsic part and the band of uh, how much from the intrinsic part and some kinds of band of others. If you try to map this concept to uh -huh. here. Then, if somehow I can fit uh, the thermal resistivity or something like that, and from there I can extract that how much contribution coming from the spinon and how much contribution coming from the magnon, because the 
the magnon part is coming due to this topological thing and the due to this t by j term and all these stuff are coming due to this topological part and if you compare this to the magnonic part i mean the, if you compare fermionic to boson if i compare my magnon to the extrinsic and the spon uh, spinon to the intrinsic then is there any ex uh, experimentally if I do some kinds of fitting in the resistivity, I mean the thermal resistivity data, and from there I can extract the, how much contribution is coming from where? So, yeah, I'm not sure if I catch your question, but uh, you are asking the, uh, how we can distinguish the contribution from magnons and spin -off. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So in harmonic the... system, what people did, they just fit the resistivity data. And from there, they are saying that some, some of the parts are coming from the intrinsic and some of the part coming from the extrinsic. If somehow the so intrinsic the, mechanism is dominating okay. there, then the band topology will come there so in the, harmonic system. If I map this concept to the this bosonic system, mm -hmm. but did it? So, but, but the, uh, go ahead. Sorry, I think uh, he's trying to ask that. Uh, how you uh, how can you determine the person uh, this uh, uh, part? Uh, so I think what he's asking is yeah. that can you separate the separate can the you fit and separate the magnon and the phonon separate out by fitting oh, something? Is that right? So I think he was asking the. Uh, no, no. I think he said it is phonon, but I think yeah. he, I think he, he meant phonon and and that's magnon and magnon. But uh, yeah, yeah. He, he was also asking the difference yeah. between the. Uh, intrinsic and extrinsic yeah, so contributions, in right? Harmonic system, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's a extrinsic. different story, right? So, I think, yeah, in, in my talk, I have been entirely focusing on the intrinsic <coughs> contribution because, you know, for, for electrons, we we know what the, uh, for instance, skew scattering is, but for magnons, uh, the question what does skew, skew scattering for magnons? There must be something there, but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree, but uh, <coughs> so, so yeah, so yeah, it would be interesting. I think the question is what, uh, what are the impurities for that? Yes. Right. Yes. Yes. That is yes. the question. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So that's what I'm not very sure. Of first thing, in reality, you should have something like bond disorder, vacancies, yes. some fracturation of the uh, anisotropies or something, right? Okay. Yeah. 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 And my question is in magnon spin non static you have told that there are h spin channels but these spin channels are quantized or not i mean they are integer number no so actually uh, if you just define the uh, chan number for each band uh sorry i didn't show any uh example for uh, magnon for case but let's just consider uh, this common example because in this case, uh, because in this case, I mean, top and bottom layers are basically uh, not that uh, mixed up. So, so I mean, that's S spin SZ is concerned, but in this case, I mean, if you just look at one spin component, and I mean, the, each band carries definite integer channel number. But at some point, you told that the Fermi Hall effect is not quantized because we can't define Fermi level. Or because form. in the formula for the copper XY, you know, the both distribution function is involved, but the both distribution isn't, you know, with like a step function. Right? I mean, the Fermi distribution looks almost like the step function at low temperature, but the both distribution function looks like this. So, uh, I mean, we shouldn't ex expect the uh, quantization. 
of course, uh, if you consider something like a uh, extremely flat band at the bottom or something, then you can replace the both distribution function as a number, in which case uh, it should be quantized. But the problem is the presence of the bottom flat band just means your, uh, your I mean, magnetic order we assume was just wrong. That's why we have, you know, I mean, the, the magnetic grounds that we assume is just unstable. So it's not reasonable. And my next question is, uh, for getting uh, transverse thermal conductivity, so if the term D is important or D by G, J ratio is important? What term is important, D or D by J ratio for getting transverse or thermal hall effect? D over. So it's asking whether it is D, the D, the transiency Moriarty ah. constant is important or, or the ratio of D by J? Oh, D by J is of course important. Okay, so and the ground state order may be anything or should be ferromagnetic or anti ferromagnetic ground state order. Ferromagnetic or anti ferromagnetic doesn't actually matter. So even in the anti ferromagnetic case, I mean, the, if the, you know, you might have more non-trivial magnetic order, right? Not just the nil order. Okay. And okay, so if, if you have some competition between the Heisenberg interaction and some other terms like uh, aniso anisotropy. Okay, so time reversal breaking is not an important factor to get thermal hall effect. Yes, it's actually important. But, uh, but then why? The, even if you have anti-ferromagnetic order, it also breaks the reverse symmetry, right? Because of the magnetic orders. Yes, but, no, but maybe, maybe we can, you know, yeah. in, in just of, is, are there any other short questions? If, if not, you can, you can actually have a discussion with him yeah. after this. Are there two online questions? First one was why J negative signifies direct exchange. Yeah, this is more just a number of names. Yeah. And the second question is while introducing the unmodeled in the interaction, are you considering the things to be possible as vectors, that is, as vectors with theta and y angles? Uh, it was that mapping that you talked about. Actually, I, I, I didn't consider the spins to be classical here. I mean, this is just, uh, I don't know, operator identity, right? So I didn't explain it much, but uh, you can just divide the uh, Heisenberg plus Jabsinski Moria interaction in that fashion. That's just the operator inequality. You don't have to assume anything about the uh, spin configuration. Okay, uh, in that case, let's thank uh, second. We can have discussions with them. Uh, okay. And we will meet back at two uh, o'clock. Okay. Yeah, and then thank Professor for sharing. We'll have a photo session just